Welcome to Page to Screen, the podcast where Nikki and Christina discuss books that were turned into movies and films that were adapted from books. As always, we do remind you that spoilers lay ahead. Now we invite you to decide with us the age-old question, which is better, the book or the movie? Hey, Page to Screen listeners, are you ready to sparkle? Because we're ready to sparkle. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, welcome back to Page the Screen. Joining me, as always, my favorite doll, Christina. <gasps> oh, but your favorite. Well, you're my favorite doll, Nikki. Oh, you're my little red one. Little red doll. <laughs> uh, which one would you do? Do you want to be blue? Maybe blue or maybe the stripey one. <laughs> oh, stripey one. Be yeah. the stripey one. I'm the stripey one. <laughs> It's like the Spice Girls, but a little bit different. Um, I did not know that pills were nicknamed dolls. Oh, yeah. Until reading this book, I didn't understand that, but I get it now. <laughs> I do. I, uh, <laughs> for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, uh, <laughs> we're back this week with the pick that the people have chosen once again, Ooh. we did do a drawing, uh, a drawing, a voting process on our Instagram page. So <laughs> check out our Instagram page. We'll probably be doing this again in the future. And the people picked Valley of the Dolls. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, yes, so Valley of the Dolls is a controversial book that came out in 1966, written by Jacqueline Suzanne, which by the way, I feel like we've done a good job finding some female writers. So yeah, that's been fun. We, we didn't even like consciously do that. But uh, here we are. So <laughs> it was the best selling book of its year and to date has sold more than 31 million copies. So this is actually an extremely successful book, probably the most successful that we've had so far. Yeah. I also feel like it's the longest one we've had so far. It is quite long. And by the way, what what edition do you have? Um, that's actually a good question. I have a paperback that I bought, like, uh, I bought it for $15. I'll tell you right now what's on the inside. <laughs> I, uh, the one that I have is the 50th, um, anniversary edition. It is gorgeous. The Oh, is that so the black cover and all the polka dots all over it? Yes, oh. it's that one. And then the pages are all like this hot reddish pink. It's gorgeous. <gasps> no, I don't have that one. I think I have like whatever paperback version came out before that. Yeah, this okay. says, why does it say 1997? I def did not buy this in 1997. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Mine, I have You're to... Just... <laughs> Eight years old in third grade yes. reading Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> Don't worry about it, teach. I get it. Oink. Um, no, I have the pink paperback cover with the pills cut out. And then um, okay. when you open yeah. it up, it has a photo of Patty Duke, Sharon Tate, and Barbara Perkins on the bed. Okay. Yep. It is beautiful. This photo of these the women. Oh, my God. I know. Ugh. It's so iconic. Oh, don't even get me started. I cannot wait till we talk about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, for now, we're on the book. So the book already, it's, uh, there are, I'll get right to it. There's some differences yeah. between the book and the movie. But yeah. um, this one starts in the 1940s. So we've got three women. It's Anne, Neely, and Jennifer. And all three of them end up in the entertainment industry in different levels. But they also have a little bit of a pill problem. <laughs> but we'll... <laughs> Some that more than slow. others. <laughs> <laughs> so this is your second, no, third time reading it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Third time. And it's funny. I I know I didn't buy this in 1997. I'm pretty sure <laughs> I bought this bef definitely before I moved to New York. And it's funny because I, I like Anne, come from a small Massachusetts town. Which I thought was so funny. I was thinking about you. Right? Like, I felt, I know that, like, the first time I read it, I don't think I, without doing a lot of the research on, like, all of the stuff that was going on at the time, um, like I did for the podcast this time around, uh, you know, I felt a connection to Anne, but only a very minor one. As, as we discussed the book, you'll all understand, I definitely don't connect to Anne very much towards the end of this book. <laughs> but... 
her desire to want to be her own woman, you know, to move from to move out of her family house and move to a big city is such a big change for anybody. And then, you know, to decide to be your own person was something I was always like, oh, yeah, Anne. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's a that's what's so interesting about all three of the women, really, is that they all. You know, they all want to be their own person and they all kind of want to be like financially independent. Right. Which for, you know, for the 40s where it's set and, you know, the 60s when it came out are still such a radical idea that a woman doesn't want to wait for a man to have the money to take care of her. She wants the money herself so she can take care of herself and her man. It's so strange because the the book is very feminist in that, sure, you've got probably more Anne who wants love however all three they are more focused in on yes their own identity um being able to support themselves having a strong career yeah and then the romantic part is certainly there but it's not their only driving force yet at the same time the book is homophobic it's yeah. a little racist it body shaves there's it sets oh, it's back age, a little bit ageism like <laughs> yeah. it is it is both it is both a radical feminist novel and also sounds like it was written by a man. <laughs> exactly. Do you know what? Like you're reading some of these pages and you're reading some of the things that these women are saying, especially mm-hmm. um there's a part in the book where we find out about Jennifer's past. Mm-hmm. And she had a brief like lesbian affair. Well, almost like a lesbian grooming situation. Yes. With a uh, a girl from her like boarding school and you're reading it and you're like, this definitely sounds like something a man wrote because this right. doesn't, it doesn't feel cohesive with some of the other stuff that was going on right before you get to that chapter. <laughs> and the, I don't know, the, maybe it's just me. Every time I read that part, I'm like, it feels clunky. It It, it is clunky. And I, I don't want to, I don't know. Jacqueline Suzanne seems like she was just kind of this baller, badass bitch. Like yeah. just looking at pictures of her kind of gets me gagged. She is just such a oh, gorge, right? A spark, yeah. And at the same time, the <laughs> the book is clunky, is a little nice. It's it can be very bitchy, very soap opera, very kind of the writing can get frankly bad at times. Yeah. And I don't know. It's just it it's a little inconsistent. Yeah, and when the book came out, there were a lot of reviews. Mostly, my favorite one is Truman Capote's, where he says that she didn't write on a typewriter; she wrote on a cash register. Um, <laughs> which, when you when you first read that, you're like, "What do you mean?" And then you you you're like, "Oh yeah, she's she's writing for the money." Right. But it it launched a whole career for her. Which, mm-hmm. when you think about what what her life was like, yeah, I mean she. Uh, she really is Anne Neely and Jennifer all wrapped yes. into one. This is her story, legit. Um, because you have, you know, she she was from a small town, moved to the city, just like Anne. You know, she she has a son who um, is like autistic, and she puts him in a. This is so bad. She puts him in a like a sanitarium for his whole life. Mm-hmm. It's just very depressing. But she also has breast cancer. Which threw me. Yeah. Which that honestly, that part of the book yeah. was so depressing. It's always so yep. depressing. And it's not even like the middle of the book. <laughs> it's oh, we'll get we'll get to why that one really sucks. But really, she also had a um there was a rumored lesbian relationship with Ethel Merman. Yeah. <laughs> which I was like, I'm I'm sorry. You mean there's no business like show business at all, Merman? Show business indeed. Oh. Getting down to the business. Wink, wink, <laughs> Ethel Merman. I see you. Which was just so... I'm so gobsmacked. I'm so... Jacqueline Suzanne could do no wrong in my eyes. She was married the whole time, too. I know. Which I'm just... Well, that's a bit of a problem, but... <laughs> she had it. She had it all and then some. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you know the lesbian part um the funny thing that i thought about that was that when it's jennifer and the um the lady yeah uh 
they're like, well, we're not like those lesbians. And, you know, we're not gay. We're just having fun. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, you're sleeping with a woman for three years. I would consider that yeah. gay, but who am I to judge? Yeah. The only thing she says that they're not, they're not gay because they don't dress like men and cut their hair short. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Oh, that's that's the marker now. Okay, right. <laughs> it is it is extremely bizarre the way they they talk about you know certain things like sex and there's a part about religion in the book too. Mm-hmm. Right at the start when Anne gets engaged to the weird Italian guy, um, there is just a lot in this book. Which when you look at the size of the book, you want it's. It's like a a female war and peace right. <laughs> or a less racist gone with the wind. Right. Like it is. A, it is. A, it, you're correct. It's, it's an epic. And it, yeah. the fact that it goes from the 1940s through the 1960s, mm-hmm. I mean, it spans decades and you've got women going from young women to, uh, you know, I think Anne refers to herself as middle aged. I don't know if she's technically middle aged, yeah. but um, you know, they have a lot of life experiences over all of these years and the people who they are at the beginning versus the ones who they are at the end are completely different. They're 30 at the end. They're <laughs> they 30. act like they're 50. <laughs> they Can act I... like they're 50. <laughs> Once more for the people in the back, they're 30. <laughs> I <laughs> livid. Let me tell you, I, I know this is the first time I'm reading the book since I've entered my 30s. And when I was reading some of the stuff where they were talking about like how old they were. <laughs> oh, if I had a fireplace, I'd just throw the book in and be done with it. <laughs> it was, you know, we're coming off of reading Mommy Dearest. And then outside of the podcast, you and I, I read it off of your recommendation, the uh, the Push yeah. book. And <laughs> between those three, I'm like, I do not want kids. Yeah. This all those three books in a row is a little rough. <laughs> You're kind of sitting there going, mm-hmm. Makes sense now. <laughs> I'm just I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> but it it is crazy. It's I I understand why when this book came out, it was considered, you know, trash and you know, people didn't like it because it's, it, it's, it's, what am I trying to say here? It, it's lurid in some of its descriptions mm-hmm. of things that definitely didn't need to be. Sure. Uh, but, but also at the same time, I, I, you know, I agree. I think it has a very like feminist hand to it, especially some of the parts of the book that I thought were so well written were the parts where they talk about how, you know, she's, Anne's investing her money into stocks and bonds. Yeah. And I was like that, when I think about like when Anne's investing money, it's the forties in the book, but it, you know, the book came out in the sixties. And I'm like, even in the sixties, I don't think women had their own money to invest in anything. They didn't have their own financial freedom. Right. And so Anne is probably the most out of all of them, like this career girl. And she unfortunately gets obsessed with this guy named Lion and then ends up being this kind of poster child for a makeup line and or, you know, a model. And then you've got Neely, who is essentially the Judy Garland of the bunch. And she becomes a recording artist and a giant movie star, wins an Oscar and then off to the side, you've got Jennifer, who is a body. So she goes from performing as a showgirl to then doing these foreign films that are considered smut, but also art house. So she's actually, um, you know, lauded for her acting ability. But all three of them go through a lot of heartache and pill abuse. And it was weird because... Yeah, you've got some problematic stuff, but then you have a real struggles. Like with Neely, when she has her drug and alcohol problem, she is right when she says this is 
what they force me to be. I'm working constantly. Yeah. I don't even have time on my own. And when she breaks that down, even though she's being a spoiled brat all the time, it has that same heartbreak that you get when you read about Judy Garland in her real life. Yeah. It's it's hard reading the stuff about Neely, especially when you go back to the beginning of the book and she's just that young girl eating cookies or reading Gone with the Wind. <laughs> and you're just like you want like by the end of the book you're like i wish i wish we could have that girl back this young neely, 17 year old neely is so hard for me because out of the three of them she was the one that made me want to pull out my hair yeah because she is just so incredibly mean and cruel judgmental she's just angry but it's like, is she that way because she's so messed up because she's so high all the time? Or is that who she is? I don't know. Because the only two times really that you see this kind, sweet, just whippersnapper of a young girl is right at the beginning. And then when she is in the um, recovery place and she's clean and sober oh, yeah. for the first time in years. After the sleep cure. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Every time I read about the sleep cure, I think once again of Kendra Wilkinson. I know. <laughs> Every time. Uh, for those who don't know, it, it's an actual thing too. The sleep cure was an actual thing that they did at the time. It's where they purposely put you under and <laughs> and you sleep for like they'll let you sleep for like a week at a time, and they feed you through a tube and they exercise your body while you're asleep, and you wake up feeling refreshed and dewy and beautiful. <laughs> I could use a sleep cure. <laughs> um, but yeah, Neely, of all of the characters, like, I I think of them as people, like, if, if I were a person in this world, who would I want to hang out with the most? And honestly, Jennifer. Jennifer exactly, is so sweet to everyone. Mm -hmm. And she knows, Jennifer knows she has no talent, but she's taking care of her family back home. So she's sending all of her money to them. And she's she feels like she's forced to use her body and her sexuality to get things to take care of her family. And all she really wants is is love unconditional. And not in like the Joan Crawford unconditional love kind of way. Right. Like legitimate <laughs> love. And she thought she had it. With Tony Polar, that didn't I, happen. Oh, look, Jennifer is the most heartbreaking, and yeah. I do want to talk about prop in my mind the most fucked up moment in the book, but also probably I think the best part of the book, just from a storytelling perspective. And it's a little uh, R-rated what I'm about to say, so I'm going to try and say it like not to be too you know, crass about it, yeah. but she's with Tony Poehler, who is kind of like this Frank Sinatra-esque type guy. So he's like a, a singer and good looking and she's dating him. She really wants to marry him. It's a mixture between her actual attraction to him. Plus she's just terrified that she's going to age out of being the body. So she has to get married to have some stability, but she's not like a, just a complete gold digger. It's, it's certainly an aspect, but it's not her only driving force. So yeah. He's got this sister who is completely in control of him. So she gets him to elope with her. And one of the ways that she does it is that she tells him that he can do anything to her. And they're alluding to backdoor sex. <laughs> <laughs> and they go and they elope and they get married. And then it cuts to the wedding night where she lets him do that and she's in pain and then she's like well just smile because you're mrs tony polar and then immediate cut to his sister's point of view where she tells the the reader about how he is has the mental yeah. capability of a 12 year old and that he will eventually be just completely a, an invalid and in a, a home somewhere and it's just like holy shit so Jennifer is putting herself through this and it's not going to end well. And this is just so freaking tragic. And moments like that, I think, are just a highlight of how difficult it is to be a woman and how hard it is for her to find love. And I don't know. It just really struck me. Yeah. The whole thing with Miriam 
and Tony and Jennifer is so it's so sad Mm -hmm. especially when you realize like Miriam had to raise her own little half brother and then she never tells him he has this disease that's going to put him in a home one day and it's one of those things where you're like how can you not how can you let him run around and do you know how can you do this and not tell anybody she doesn't even tell Jennifer until after they're in California and Tony cheats on Jennifer with somebody else and she <sighs> leaves goes back to New York she's three months pregnant Miriam comes to the city and tells Jennifer this and then tells her on top of the fact that Tony has it that whatever he has is gonna you know ca- be carried down the line and your kid's gonna have it too and so awful. at that time when you're reading it, Jennifer is thinking she's going to have the baby. Tony's going to see the baby and want to get back together and have that family that Jennifer wanted. And it's just so crushing. Mm-hmm. And then to read her going out and finding a doctor and having an abortion. And you feel bad for the sister, too, because you want to just make her the villain Yet, both of them, by the end of that conversation, see each other for the first time and understand that neither of them are bad and that both of them are just trying their hardest in this shitty world. And they kind of have, I don't want to say like a respect, but an understanding of one another before they part ways for the final time. Yeah. It's just, everything with Jennifer was just so hard to read and jennifer like that's why i i think jennifer would be the one person i would be like let's hang out let me be your friend neely i would never want to be around (laughs) (laughs) neely was so annoying like and neely is just she's just mean neely gets very very awful very 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 awful after moving to california um right she cheats on her husband with a fashion designer, marries him, has twins. But then this is where it gets interesting. When she catches him, uh, her second husband, sleeping with another woman in their swimming pool or fooling around with the woman in their swimming yeah, pool. Yeah, they're not sleeping in the pool. They're not sleeping in the pool. <laughs> they're dead. Yeah. They're, they're, she drowned them in the pool. They're sleeping. Um she catches him in the pool with a naked lady, and they they have this fight, and she's basically saying to him, like, he, he says to her, you don't need me as a husband. You need me to fight your battles for you. And she says something to him along the lines of, like, well, what, what do you expect? I work all day. Mm-hmm. And it's true, like, he, it's, you're reading this part, and it's like, What he expects her to do is her job plus all the wifely duties that he expects a wife to do for him, you know? Like, to please him, even though she's been working all day. Yeah, and that's, like, a repeated issue in the book that... Jennifer is willing to give up her career so that she will have a kid and she's perfectly fine doing that. She just wants to be happy and, and kind of has the same thing where she wants a baby and she's struggling with the, the idea of balancing career and baby and husband. It, it's just, I don't know. It's yeah. very difficult to be a woman back then now and balance all of that together with the expectation that you're still going to look the way you did when you, you know, first get married. Yeah. And, Anne, oh, Anne, Anne's the type of friend that you would have over and she'd complain about a relationship and you'd just say, leave him. I could not. Okay. With (laughs) Anne, Anne reminded me of Carrie Bradshaw. I knew you were going to say that because that's what I wrote down too. I was like, (laughs) I was like, she's such a carry. She is such a carry because she, and she's also a little boring. Like out of the three, she's probably the most boring. And I wonder because um, Jacqueline Suzanne 
Anne is probably closest to her. Then Neely is like the pseudo Judy Garland and Jennifer is like a, a loosely based Marilyn Monroe. So I almost wonder if her imagination created these other two characters that are really interesting, whereas Anne is kind of boring. Yeah. Um, Anne also but, comes off as like a Grace Kelly, very, yes, very yes. princessy, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So Anne gets together with this son of a bitch named Lion and he she's like she loses her virginity to him and is constantly saying how much she loves him she adores him he's not saying that back no okay no he's not at all oh but wait even before she loses her virginity to him she's engaged <laughs> right to a very rich italian man who seems he seems all right right like he yeah he actually doesn't seem like a bad guy his and he- dad's a little wishy-washy but he seems super <laughs> dedicated to her and he waits for her for they haven't had sex nothing and she's just he hasn't even kissed her (laughs) she's repeatedly like i'm not going to marry you and he's like they'll come around (laughs) no means try again later (laughs) he i mean that's a little bit of his fault don't do the wear down technique it's a horrible thing to do to a woman but he seems like he's an all right guy and He's not unattractive, but she's just obsessed with this asshole named Lion. And I don't know. It pissed it's, me off. It's a weird relationship because she she's in love. She claims to be in love with Lion Burke. They've slept together once. And she's like, I've I've been she says things like, I just wanna like I always wanna be with him. I wanna be around him, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, do you really? Or is it just, right. you know, exciting for you? Because she she grew up very, like, waspy uh, in Massachusetts. Yeah, as we all do, darling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> lies. But she, she grew up very, like, waspy New England girl. And she finally gets something. Like, she's too polite to ever say no about her first engagement. Even though she's trying so hard to, she never just comes right out and looks at him and just says no. She's just like, "Ah, but I don't want to marry you. And it's like, just say, just say N-O, just say no and be done with it. The whole book is Anne being too wishy-washy on any subject to really take a stand. Right. And I think that's the main problem with Anne's character is that you're, you want her to just say what she wants and commit to it. Because mm-hmm. even after, even after her fling with Lion, because they they lived semi lived together, lived together in his apartment mm-hmm. for a while, and then he 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 does this weird thing. So Anne's mom dies, and her aunt dies, and Anne's got cash. <laughs> Anne's got a lot of money because that that rich Italian guy left her the engagement ring too. And once again, I will say she invested her money wisely. Um, <laughs> She's loaded, and Lion yeah. Burke is not. And he's like, I want to be able to provide for you. And he goes to her her mom's house in Massachusetts. And he's like, well, I could just stay in this house and write, and we could just live here together and be a perfectly normal couple, but we won't get married. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she's still like, she says to him something like that makes him leave, and she's all upset, but she's still like, I'm still in love with you. <laughs> have you seen what the color red looks like, and have you ever seen a flag? Because if you put the two together, I'm sure it looks like <laughs> Lion Burke, okay? Big old red flag. <sighs> then he runs away to England to write his crap book about the war this <laughs> crappy book about the war because he kept saying once the book's a hit we'll get married like these women choose the worst men well and Anne Anne ends up with this the guy with the makeup company and he makes her into a superstar yeah. um, oh Kevin Caldwin. I liked it, him yeah I liked him too <laughs> and he is very nice they're sleeping together they're like they're together together and then she cheats on him with fucking lion yeah she's the worst 
<laughs> she's the worst. And she's cheating on him with Lion. He knows about it. And then when he reacts poorly, because of course he's a human being and he's a mixture between jealous, he's upset. He's also much older than her. Yeah. So there's this sad thing where he has like a heart attack and stuff. So he is trying to keep her and he goes from like you need to never see him again to listen if you're with him that's okay I'll I just want you you know I'll be here he's kind of going back and forth which again is kind of understandable with what he's going through and she thinks of him as less of a man for having a reaction to her cheating on him yeah and that is so that I was like is it because of how she was raised about feelings because at the yeah. start of the book, her mom basically tells her, like, a woman doesn't reveal any feelings in public around anybody. <sighs> so when she has mm-hmm. her husband who is actively being emotional to her and releasing all these emotions, is it is that why she's thinking of him as less than a man? Because he's, he has some form of emotion. And the only man she ever thought was a man was Lion Burke, who was so closed off that, you know, you needed a pickaxe, a lock. <laughs> an axe a locksmith like you know it doesn't he's the mr big oh god awful <laughs> and you know the whole time with Anne because she has a boss named henry and henry is there the whole time and is probably her best friend more than um yeah. the other two girls and henry is always there he's always listening to her telling her advice that she never takes he helps her out throughout the the timeline in the book i thought they were gonna get together i thought at the end that because he even says like i've had a crush on you this whole time he i thought that they were gonna end up together at the end like in a you you were right there the whole time kind of a thing nope no i always read him as like a like a daddy warbucksy sort of character like a lot (laughs) older than her yeah uh, but she a, likes the older guys yeah she does like them old um <laughs> <laughs> but i always imagine it more like a it's more of a father-daughter situation because she didn't really know her dad right um because he died so young i always saw it as that less than uh yeah but women have daddy issue. issues so that doesn't that actually plays into it <laughs> yeah she has strong daddy issues and has daddy <laughs> issues for days but um <laughs> Going back to Anne, you know, sleeping with not just Kevin, but Lion, you know, I think those are the only two people that she she sleeps with in the book, whereas, mm-hmm. you know, Jennifer and Neely are just bed hopping, or as, what's her name? Helen. Helen calls it the kip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping in the kip. Uh, it's interesting when you think about when the book was released Mm-hmm. Uh, contraception, like the pill, wasn't available for for all women until 1975. You had to be married, and I think you already had to have like a child. Like you had to be married and knew that this wasn't. You did not want more kids <laughs> before the Which a bullshit, doctor would even bullshit. say to you, "Okay, this is the, this is the deal." So to read about these women, you know, jumping in the kip. <laughs> I love that term. <laughs> when I make my bed later today, I'm going to be like, making the kip. <laughs> Jesse's going to be like, what? I'm be like, I have to make the bed. Okay, the bed. Um, <laughs> when, you, when Zuzu crawls into her little, her little oh. bed, I'm going to be like, oh, Zuzu's in the kip. Um, <laughs> but when you think about it, the book being set in the 40s, like that is, that is a very interesting thing to put in there to inject mm-hmm. so much of the the 60s lifestyle of you know women's liberation into this 1940s kind of world like i you, it's not something i generally expect when i read yeah. about the 40s you know yeah yeah it, like the only um the only birth control that's li- they talk about diaphragms abortions mm-hmm. and then pulling out like there's no there's obviously no just they're on birth control. Yeah. Even condoms. They don't really talk about condoms, do they? No. Wow. They don't really talk about... They don't talk about any contraceptive methods, but they do talk about getting abortions. Yeah. I think Jennifer, at one point in the book, says she's had, like, seven. Yeah. Which... And it, yeah, because she's older and she wants to have... Um, 
kids with the politician and she's like, yeah, I've had these abortions, but I'm still good. Yeah. So with this book, once the women all leave New York and head to California, that's when everything goes. That's when we are really introduced to the dolls. Yeah. And I read an interesting article that, because when I first read the book, I didn't understand why they would call them dolls, these pills. And it's because when you're, you know, when you're a kid, you have your, you have your doll that you carry with you everywhere. It's like you're like your security blanket. That's why the pills are called dolls because you take ah. them with you everywhere and it's, it's something you have every day. It's with you all the time. So it's your security oh. blanket. Sneaky, sneaky. Right? I was like, ah, now I get it. <laughs> I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> and it's, once I get to California, I guess, like, Neely can get whatever she wants from the studio. Um, Jennifer's taking pills, you know, to help her out with the Tony um, stuff before she goes to France and does her art films. But it's when Anne starts taking the pills that it gets really interesting, too. Oh, Because she God. holds off for so long. She's the last and, one to uh, join the train. And uh, what is it that sends her over to make her need the dolls? Is it something with Lion Burke? Oh, um, yeah. So, Neely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know. Our uh, favorite. Uh, everybody's favorite villain. Um, Neely, her career is completely destroyed because of her dependence on pills she's like just taking what was it like 60 in one day yeah she has multiple sins in the hospital whether it's for they thought it was suicide or she needs to go into re and then lion um his course with his career from writer back into the talent agency stuff and they decide to make a comeback for neely and Anne is pregnant and married now to lion and Neely and Lion start an affair. Yeah. A real and, a real humdinger of an affair, too. <laughs> and Neely is purposely doing it. Yeah. Neely gets – this is when Neely definitely gets really vindictive because yes. Neely tells Lion that Anne basically paid Henry to give the business over to Lion – this is such a drop, like a soap opera. It is so so. <laughs> it is so like Days of Our Lives. All my children. It is, and it's it's like reading. It's like reading page six or like a uh, like blind right. gossip. You know, it is. It's the Perez Hilton of its time. You are reading one extremely long gossip column. The entire book. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, this thing with Neely and Lion. It's also really interesting because Lion, there's a there's a part in the book where Anne picks up the other phone and listens to their conversation, and Lion basically is like, at one point he he says to Neely that oh yeah last night I told her that I want a divorce but she won't leave me, and Anne's like, uh no you didn't, <laughs> and you're like, why are you still with this man? Yeah. Why do you still love him? You know for a fact he is doing this. And it is awful and it is horrendous. And why do you still let Neely into your life? Because it comes and goes in spits and spurts, their relationship. And I think right before Neely starts the affair, though, with Lion is when Jennifer, um, spoiler alert, Jennifer commits suicide. Oh, this one was rough. Everything with Jennifer, I think, is probably the best parts of the book. And yeah. ironically, out of the three of them, even though her story is the most compelling, she is probably the least featured. Actually, she's certainly the, she's the least featured the least out featured. of the three. Um, mm -hmm. Which is so – I would much rather have had Jennifer be the lead of the book than Anne. I agree. Yeah. Um, but before, before Jennifer commits suicide, there is a part that – like, I want to vomit <laughs> – <laughs> and that's when um, she's in the hospital because she's she's had like an extended period situation and she goes to a doctor. She has cysts that they remove, but then they also find a lump in her breast. Uh, so they they find out that she has breast cancer, just like our author did. And they tell her that they have to remove uh, her breast. But the senator who she's 
engaged to. She's she wants to start a family with. You know, he loves her. He loves her for her body, basically. And you know this for a fact because he says to her, I didn't I didn't really care so much about the family thing. I'm old. It's fine. These are my babies. As he <laughs> <laughs> as he touches her breasts and lays his head on his breast on her breast. And then he goes, Who scarred my baby? <laughs> <laughs> and every time I'm just like oh god why why are you saying this that's what it, really drives her to commit suicide what's crazy about it is that it is such a compelling plot point and it's so devastating the her cancer diagnosis and that she's going to have to have the mastectomy and she is told her whole life she's nothing but a body so in losing it she is left with nothing she thinks oh this one guy though he loves me for me and to have him make a comment is heartbreaking yeah but this is where the writing comes into question because it's a little heavy handed <laughs> to have this guy nuzzle against her breast and be like, my baby. Like it's <laughs> so weird. It made me laugh. And like, I'm so torn because it's so awful, but I'm laughing because I'm like, who wrote this? It grossed me out. I'm like, it's gross. It's, it's gross. so gross. I'm like, yeah, this is awful. Like, don't say that my baby. <laughs> These, these are my babies. My precious. No. Gollum, it's go very away. much my precious, exactly. <laughs> oh, goodness. Like, oh, God. It's so awful. It's so it is awful. so awful. And then, you know. And this is before, too. I mean, and it, going through all of that nowadays is still such a struggle, but. Now, if you are someone like Jennifer, you know, you look at what happened with Angelina Jolie and she could nowadays, if Jennifer was in existence, she could probably get reconstructive surgery and get, you know, breast implants. So yeah. her career wouldn't necessarily be over if the, if it's something that they caught and they're able to do preventative surgery, it wouldn't be as devastating now. And I'm, when I say that, I'm saying like someone with her money and status would be able to get it done because yeah. I know plenty of people who don't have health care and don't have the resources, the mastectomy, they don't necessarily get the choice of reconstructive surgery. But it's just like the time frame adds another level of heartbreak for Jennifer. Yeah. It's just, I wish all we had to talk about was Jennifer because mm -hmm. like Jennifer's whole story arc is cut too short too soon and i just i just want to give her a hug and it's so oh oh jennifer i hate that we're stuck with neely <laughs> really really do she's yeah. a soul sucker god i hate neely um it's i i want to say something to everyone who's listening i know it sounds like we're probably hopping around a ton but let me tell you this book is it is heavy. Mm -hmm. You know, what? like, like there are parts where you're reading, you're reading the dialogue and literally the page is just two people talking back and forth for a while <laughs> about stuff that is so inconsequential to everything else. Like her mink was red. Oh, blah. And you're like, oh, what does that have to do with anything else? Can we just skip 10 pages or something? It's so it's kind of. Where Mommy Dearest was not super linear, but still told a, a compelling story from from beginning to end, this book is completely linear and completely full, and you have to sit back and just let it go forever. Because <laughs> the chapters, the chapters aren't even written as chapters. They're not like chapter one, chapter two. It's like Jennifer, and then it'll be like January nineteen forty five. You know, September 1945, and it's like two hours worth of one section of a book, and then you'll have Neely, 1945, turn the page, Jennifer, 1946, and you're like, w how are you figuring out how long these sections of the book need to be, Miss Lady? What is going <laughs> on? How many pills did you take when you were writing this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're kind of like, there's just so much. There's so much exposition it's a lot of exposition no. 
Like the forties last almost the entire <laughs> first half of the book. Yeah. The fifties blink and you miss it. And then right. the sixties are the very last thick chunk. Yeah. It's so it's such a weird way to present this story, especially once you get into the sixties and Jennifer's gone. And then you're left with Neely and yep. you I thought it was interesting, and this is the difference in the time frame or the time periods, where with the struggle that Neely has with her weight, that like they never talk about exercise. Exercise is not a thing. The only mention really to exercise, there's two. It's both of Jennifer. Jennifer does like these breast exercises mm -hmm. to keep them firm. And then the politician guy the senator that she is with and makes a comment that for such an older man he has a flat stomach so he must go to the um men's athletic clubs and aside from that any type of weight loss that they have to go through it's all with pills and starvation essentially yeah. and you know not eating certain things and I thought that was just like so interesting because nowadays and part and we talked a little bit about this pre-episode that we are in a little bit more of a body positivity yeah, like era and being a certain weight. It, it's a lot more to do with like health than necessarily just like super skinny. That's not necessarily like quote unquote in right now, but it still made it very funny when Neely is her biggest, which I think they say is like 160 pounds, which yeah. is a joke. <laughs> and she goes to dinner with Lion, and she eats two dozen escargot. And I was like, Bleh. like two dozen yeah. escargot. That sounds just. I love escargot. Okay, two dozen escargot makes me want to vomit. <laughs> well, maybe that was her goal. <laughs> maybe it's honestly a lot of that stuff when it talks about like exercise and the price of fame. When you when you look at it in those. Like, if you look at just those sections of the book, it's really a book that's a cautionary tale. Yes. You know, like, don't get famous. <laughs> that's what the book Valley of the Dolls, also known as Don't Become Famous, because <laughs> that's all that happens to these women is they get addicted to pills, they all drink a lot of alcohol, and they <laughs> – let me rephrase that about the addiction to the pills, because – Honestly, when you look at Neely and Anne, not Neely, I guess Jennifer and Anne, they are, the pills aren't forced on them. Actually, all three of them, the pills aren't initially forced on them. Mm -hmm. They have decided to take them as a way to control some other aspects of their lives that they couldn't control. Jennifer right. was constantly losing sleep over, you know, money issues. So she starts taking pills to be able to control her sleep patterns. Uh, Neely starts taking the pills uh, because the studio told her that she needs to lose weight and apparently exercise was not invented then. So <laughs> apparently they never heard of the Olympics. Um, <laughs> so she starts taking the pills on her own to start losing weight. Then she starts taking the same sleeping pills that Jennifer takes on her own. Just And she starts mixing her own pills by mm -hmm. herself. That's all their own decisions. So even though they do get addicted to the pills, it is something that they uh, – I just wanted to be clear that it's not something where nowadays I feel like there's a lot of pressure to – like if that were a thing now, I feel like there'd be more pressure from social media to be like, I have to take these pills. Just like, you know, like the Kardashians are constantly telling us to drink right. diet teas. So people yeah. buy diet teas because they're like, that's what I need and it's being pushed on you by these people who are already thin. But these women were taking these all on their own. There was no advertisement. Well, it, it was for, for all three of them. It starts like pretty innocent, where yeah. they just need to sleep. They just need help sleeping, and it's either you know stress or I mean mostly stress, where they can't shut their mind off at night in order to sleep, and that affects the way that they look, the way that they function. So it all just starts with one red pill to help them sleep, and. With Anne and Jennifer, it's not nearly as much as a problem as it is for Neely because Neely, I, and this is where I thought that Jacqueline Suzanne actually did a really good job where Neely goes from one pill to one pill with a drink to two pills with a drink. And then 
for the TV show, she has six red pills, then another two, an entire thing of, of scotch, and then another two. And then it jumps to she takes an entire bottle in one day. It's just like and, – but all that's very slow. It's a slow yeah. progression from – one pill to one pill to help her out to this this is a problem and she's not even eating it's just pills and scotch and that's that and it's really sad that's where the tragedy comes in because if you just take a sleeping pill it's not necessarily a bad thing but she's taking she's doing the judy garland she's taking the uppers in the morning to cancel out the pills at night and so that she can perform on stage, she's taking weight loss pills. She is then taking the sleeping pills when she gets anxious before a performance. Then she's taking a ton of sleeping pills at night. And it's just like this bad cycle. Yeah. And that's – we'll we'll probably talk about it a little bit more when we talk about the movie. But that's where the book gets it right and the movie gets it wrong. Right. The description of how these women fall into the pill habit and their feelings – while taking the pills and how they discuss the pills is – I feel like in the book – I don't want to say it feels more realistic because the book is not realistic at all. No one just finds fame. Um, if they did, you and I would be famous already. Uh, <laughs> we would be Anne. We'd just walk into a party and they'd be like, be our Gillian girl. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a big contrast uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit between the – the pill taking in the book and the pill taking in the movie that it's, it's almost a little like a subtlety in the book Mm -hmm. because it's true. You don't notice how bad Neely gets until you get to the point where she has to be checked in somewhere. And then you realize, Oh, she had been doing this for almost half of a book. The, the huge problem I felt with Neely was that she never says that she needs to quit. Yeah. She never, even when she gets sent into the recovery place, there's not a single time that she thinks the pills are bad. I need to stop with the pills. I need to stop with the alcohol. I need to figure this out. She never thinks that. The only thing that she thinks even close to it is I got to lose weight and I need to get back into good shape so that I can perform. But she never actually wants to quit. And that's like the huge problem because Anne wants to help her and keeps, you know, spending money on treatment for Neely and getting Neely back into a TV program or to have line helper. But Neely's not asking for that help. And Neely doesn't realize that she's got a problem. Neely never says she's sorry either throughout the whole never. book. Nope. She's never apologetic for anything that she's, that she does. No. And that was also a thing that bothered me for someone so young to be so crappy to everyone around her. You know what I mean? Like, it was very much like, it's going to be, that's going to sound awful. Like, you know how we talked about Christina in Mommy Dearest being a bit mm-hmm. of a brat yeah. in the film? It's like a film version, Christina became a star. Right. Like, I feel like that's the kind of level Neely's at when she first moves to California. She's very, like, bratty about everything and never apologizes for a single thing she does. And she seems to think that everyone in the world has it out to get her. There is this interesting theory that when someone becomes a celebrity, that the age that they are when they become a celebrity will forever stunt them if they're too young. So it's the reason why... Um, child actors have difficulty um, like just kind of being a normal person because they become famous really early on. It's a theory behind like why someone like Tom Cruise is the way he is because from that age, whether it's eight or 15 or whatever, you are given everything. Everybody says yes to you. So you never are forced to mature beyond that age. And for Neely, it's, she's what, 17, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so she is. She acts like a shitty seventeen-year-old, someone who is angsty and doesn't want to listen to mommy and daddy. Someone who knows best, wants to have this party life, wants all of the attention, and she's stuck there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually, especially when you think about Neely in the book and celebrities in general. That does make a lot of sense. Ugh, except for Drew Barrymore, she got out. <laughs> well, she also went to rehab at a young age, so. And I'm proud of her. She has a TV show now. 
<laughs> I hope she listens and, to this episode. I love you, Drew. <laughs> I love Never Been Kissed. <laughs> And ever after. Oh, my God. Ever after. <laughs> oh, my life ever after. Oh. To fly. <laughs> this is such like a, a departure from Valley of the Dolls. I but know. I don't know why, but Carlos has it in for uh, the main guy in Ever After. And the way he says his name kills me. He's like, do Gray Scott. <laughs> do. <laughs> do Gray Scott. I love it. <laughs> Um, well, is there anything else you want to say about the book, or do you think we can switch over to the movie? I just want to touch briefly on the end of the book. Oh, my God. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. You're we, right. You're, when you're right, you're right. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> so the end of the book, I, you go through these decades with these women. You know, Lion drops Neely. Jennifer is is gone. Anne has named their daughter Jennifer, which I thought was – a beautiful tribute to so her best friend. Yeah. Um, but the last, the last, like, what is it? Like a page and a half of the book mm-hmm. is something that kind of wrecks you because you are hoping beyond hope that one of these girls has moved on from all the, all the issues that they had. Right. And will succeed. Because the whole goal for all three of them was to not just meet, I feel like a manager, not just meet goals, but succeed goals. Um, (laughs) And we're with Anne. It's New Year's Eve, and she's throwing a party at her house that she felt talked into. She really doesn't even want to be out partying. And she goes to lay down in her bed. The door's open. The lights are off. And a couple walks in. And it's a very young girl. And uh, she's... She's saying how much she loves the man she's with, and she kisses him. Spoiler alert, it's Lion Burke, <laughs> Anne's husband. And yeah. it's – you. Anne says that – this is the thing that made me the angriest, like, at the end of this book. Anne says that she loves him, but she loves him a little bit less. Mm-hmm. Girl, leave him. Leave him. Oh, I just want to – leave him like I want there to be like an a, an epilogue where it's like you know and finally left her cheating ugly husband <laughs> her awful stupid husband and you know ran away with all her money to Mexico or something you know <laughs> it's it's <sighs> it's it's awful and like my husband Carlos has this thing that he says where in movies, books, what have you, just because the story ends there and everybody's happy, just because, you know, Eric and Ariel get married at the end of Little Mermaid, that's not the end of the story. Yeah. Best case scenario is that they stay together and one of them dies first and the other one has to live out their life alone. That's the best case scenario. No matter what, life is kind of tragic. And with someone like Anne, and I'm sorry, Nikki, I know that you love that movie, but there you go. Um, I was going to say like, the odds in The Little Mermaid of one of them dying first are pretty pretty up there because it was like the 1600s and they probably ended up getting smallpox, <laughs> so it's fine. Or she died in childbirth or something. Yeah, um, you know, back in the day, one of them cut their finger open <laughs> on a sheet of paper and bled out. It's fine. <laughs> Which, by the way, when they talked about abortion in this book, they're like, he even uses anesthesia. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like, oh that's that's the but highest that's, marker for you? That's the selling point of, yeah, he's got anesthesia. <laughs> so uh, Anne and Lion, there's no happy ending. There is no yeah. way that their story ends well. And that's where the sex in the city factor comes in. I don't, I don't care. Mr. Big and Carrie do not end up happy together. No. There is no way, there's no scenario where this is a happy ending. They are bad for each other and they're kind of shitty people. And yeah, it just kind of ends with Anne accepting that this is her life and that she will continue to love him a little bit less, but at least she's got her dolls. Yeah, it's, I, like it's, it's an honest ending, I guess. It is, it is. But at the same time, it is so unfulfilling. It is so... Because when you look at Anne at the beginning of the book, this strong, young, like, 19-year-old woman coming into the city to own the city, and at the end, she is – she's not owning anything. She is owned. Right. She's owned by the pills. She's owned by Lion Burke. She doesn't get what she wanted. What she wanted was to be, like, a top dog, and instead she's just there. 
Mm-hmm. And it's so, it's, it's, it reminds me of Ready Player One <laughs> when, you know, we have Artemis as a super strong character. And by the end of it, you're kind of just like, where did she go? Yeah. This is the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. And that's why it feels like sometimes when you're reading the dialogue for this book, it feels like a man wrote this book. Mm-hmm. Because I, and maybe it's just because of the things that we're reading now that are being published now by women authors. I don't think a woman author today would have allowed her to stay with him. The patriarchy is a smog that we all breathe in. <laughs> and Jack Not in Suzanne. this house. <laughs> Jacqueline Suzanne, as strong of a character that she was in her own right, and as strong as she wanted this book to be with its truth in telling these stories of these three women, unfortunately, the sexism is still there. The sexism, you know, stretches from the way that Neely talks about other women to, you know, the ending. It's it's all still there. Yeah. It's just so upsetting. I know. (laughs) Ugh. Well, with that, <laughs> I guess we can move on to the film version, which oh, feels well. like night and day, you know? <laughs> yeah, so the film version, it is a 1967, the year my mommy was born, um, 1967 cult classic directed by Mark Robson, who like purposely kind of went after controversial films. He also did... Um, one that I kind of like, Isle of the Dead, and then he did Peyton Place. Um, yeah. And it's starring Barbara Perkins. Pa- Barbara Perkins, excuse me. I, I'm confusing it because I'm thinking of Ann Perkins from Parks and Rec. So oh. Barbara Perkins plays Ann. So it's very confusing. Um, Patty, everybody's favorite, Patty Duke as Neely, and R.I.P. Sharon Tate as Jennifer. Oh, and then uh, Susan Hayward as the um, great Helen Lawson. That role was supposed to go to Judy Garland. Kills me. Kills me. Could you imagine? I can't imagine, and it was great. (laughs) I'm watching the film now, and it's an Oscar award-winning picture. Uh, But speaking of Oscars, this movie did win. Yeah. Um, John Williams got his first ever Oscar for this. which So strange. It is such a weird pull that when you're like, (laughs) wait a minute, who did the music for this? Star Wars guy? I'm sorry, what? It's so strange because I did not realize that John Williams did the score. And when I saw his name in the opening credits, I'm like, I'm sorry, excuse me, what? Yeah. <laughs> you you kind of sit there and you're like, uh, I just, I just want to, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> I think I put on the wrong film. Um. And I, I'm sorry, but I I don't like the score, and I really hate the main theme song that plays throughout the movie. It's oh, that type of music the Dion, that Dion Warwick song. Yes, it? it's yeah. the type of music that I just kind of detest from the late '60s and early '70s. It's sort of like the love theme from Love Story. Like, oh, I hate oh. those. I just found that record on my shelf the other day. So, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, why do I have this? Love means never having to say you're sorry. Ugh. Ugh. Um. Um, The main plot is, I guess, the same, but there are significant changes from tone to characters. Things are condensed. Things are thrown out. It's kind of surprising because this clock's in it two hours yet they somehow like forgot what the story was and what the point is i don't know it's it's a very strange movie it's very bizarre because right off the bat like in the book the three women are friends they've lived together you know they they came up from the bottom to the top together and in the movie they really have no relationship to each other except that they all float in the same social circles correct so it's kind of like why should i care yeah why does it matter and it's i i think that's where the book initially not the book the movie initially screws everything up is that we don't have a a common baseline to connect to yeah um and then there's other weird stuff like you know Anne Anne doesn't have a distaste for her mom and her uncle uh, her uncle her mom and her aunt and her whole hometown she comes to new york mm-hmm. city practically engaged even though in the book she hates every guy from Lawrenceville. 
I don't she's she's even more boring in the movie because the yes. little bit of spice from her story is completely stripped away. They're all really boring in the movie. Yeah. Everyone's really flat. It's I think Patty Duke is she has I think that she's really fun part. to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. at the end of Neely's art. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's the part where Jesse, because I had to watch it. I was watching it during the day while Jesse was working, like towards the end of his work day. And he finished working during that scene where yeah. she's, <laughs> we'll get to it. But he came out and he was like, why is she screaming? So <laughs> she screams so loud that it feels like she almost destroyed the mic. <laughs> yeah. I love it's it. Like reverberating. I, I think the thing that I really missed in the from the book in the that's not in the movie is you know young Neely, because when we meet yeah. her in the movie, she knows she's good, she knows she's really good. She's already in a Broadway show, and that's mm -hmm. where I feel like we don't care for her at all. So as well, she progresses, they, like I said, like, ugh. They they condense stuff. So there is another character who is just this really small character that the older star Helen Lawson wants gone from the show that Neely is also in. Yeah. And in destroying this girl's career, she Helen Lawson accidentally makes Neely a star because she's not um, threatened by Neely and she's threatened by this other girl. And then by kind of replacing them – it's an accidental whoopsies nearly becomes famous. Yeah. And in the movie, they have condensed that other girl with Neely. And where that like fails with the movie is that there is this interesting all about Eve kind of thing with the older actress and the younger actress. And um, I don't know, like that kind of conflict between the two of them and then the rising star with Neely is really interesting, but it's it's not the same in the movie. Yeah. There's no struggle for any of them. No, no. There's there's they they each find stardom overnight and follow it to to the top of the peak, you know? Like they reach they kept calling it Mount Everest, you know? And they get there <laughs> really fast and then that's it. Yeah, and Sharon Tate, her Jennifer is the one that has the most struggle because they it's very modeled in the movie where it's the same thing where she goes to do the foreign films, but they make it also look like she's playing at like sleazy nightclubs, but she's not. Yeah. It's weird. Question mark. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the foreign film <laughs> The fake foreign movie that they make where she's just like in bed making out with a guy and it's so horrible. Like I don't even know what kind of plot would end where it's just like them and then she knocks over the glass and then it's like fiend. It's so stupid. I love it. He's like, you that wine would have gotten in my shoe and then she just rolls over and it's the end. <laughs> but honestly, I I was laughing out loud. I've seen a lot of foreign films because of like past jobs in film mm -hmm. uh, they are kind of like that <laughs> i'm not even gonna lie it's there's always like a, a weird shot of like a breast for no reason it's almost like you know in fight club where he talks about how he would insert a, a blip yes. of something that's what these that's what foreign films are kind of like where it's just like Boop, nothing, nothing. You didn't see that. <laughs> That's what this was like. It was weird. Um, oh, my goodness. The movie is insane. I don't know. First of all, let's start with what we need to talk about. Hair, makeup, clothing. <laughs> Fabulous. Every, every hairdo in this movie, I kept looking at going, I need to buy extensions. <laughs> I need <laughs> thick, full hair. I need I need to figure out how to get my hair higher. I need it longer. I'll center part it if I have to. I'll Jennifer Ugh. it if I have to. But I God. want it. Your, your girl over here does not look good center part. I'm oh, sorry. neither. Neither do I. I have bangs right now. Are you kidding me? Center parting my bangs? Girl. <laughs> 
<laughs> like you're a 1910 yeah. like candy shop owner. <laughs> <laughs> like the guy from Willy Wonka. Yes. The candy man can. No. Um, I Everything that they wear, even one of my favorites is the telethon scene where Neely's singing at the telethon. And she's yeah. just wearing that simple turtleneck skirt outfit and her hair is so shiny and thick and bouncy and I was like that's the look I want every fall instead I look like sad scary and lonely (laughs) (laughs) my my favorite this one is so weird but Sharon Tate when she is at the pool oh my god the pink outfit and did you see how big her buttons are I loved it the long like bell bottomy pants that she pulls up oh and those buttons are like three inches. Like those are big buttons. I don't yeah. know why, but I want them. <laughs> it's so mod. It's so beautiful. And then she's wearing that lime green bathing suit top. Mm-hmm. Oh, she is. <laughs> I would like to take a moment just to appreciate Sharon Tate in this movie. She is gorgeous. Yeah. She's absolutely stunning. It is horrendous that we don't have more of her to really analyze because she's Oh, God, she's gorgeous. Yeah, it's a shame because this movie isn't a good movie. No, it is not. And that one vampire movie that she did is not a good movie either. But she's actually pretty good in both. And to be good in something that's trash takes a lot of talent. Yeah. So you think about her being able to succeed without a very good script and without character development. Had she actually been given a shot in something really good with a good director, a good writer, a good character, she could have really done something. She could have been huge. Yeah. If given the opportunity, she could have been huge. And it's, it is so sad that this is one of the only things that we have to look at as her I don't want to say repertoire you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but even if this is the way you leave she did it in such a stunning way like everything about her in this movie is glorious the first time we see her she's walking down a set of stairs I love it she's in that big headdress and she's in just like a leotard and yes the director over sexualizes her by putting his hand up and blocking out her face and only looking at her breasts Mm -hmm. But you see her come – she commanded that – she wasn't even center of that frame. No. She's way off on, you know, the left-hand side of the frame. But the minute she comes down that staircase, you are just like, this woman is gorgeous. Yeah, and I I read this funny um, critique that Roger Ebert gave this movie where he was saying that it was trash and how he – First off, he gets Anne and Neely confused at the very beginning of he he says that Patty Duke meets the guy in the room and drops her purse. And I'm like, um, that's the wrong person. So uh, <laughs> he wasn't paying attention. He was not paying attention. And then he says that he stops. He admits that he stops paying attention with the breast exercise scene when Sharon Tate's talking to her mom on the other end of the line. And I'm like, yeah, that scene is ridiculous. And the way it's done is ridiculous, but she's still good in it. Like she's still, you understand her exasperation and her just being completely over her mom and the demands in her body that she is like, whatever, and takes the night for herself. Like it's still good when it comes to her acting. Listen, Roger Ebert doesn't have a leg to stand on in this conversation, Mr. I wrote Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have seen it. And it's trash. You know what? I give it two thumbs down, Roger Ebert. <laughs> Fight me. Now he's going to listen to this and be like, okay. <laughs> um, but seriously, don't watch Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. It has not, it has. It is not connected to this at all. Don't do it, people. It doesn't <laughs> even have a book it doesn't even it doesn't it's about a rock band it's it's mostly just about like sex and drugs don't don't bother unless you know you <laughs> I could just do a whole episode on that one too it's a mess but we're not um this the movie is also very bizarre like we were talking about before when it comes to taking pills it is so on the surface level mm-hmm. that I don't It does not translate as well as the book did. In the book, there is – there's a kind of a reason and a slow 
a slow reasoning behind it. In the film, mm-hmm. it's like there's the one part where Anne Anne takes those pills and she takes a bunch of them and then stumbles out into the ocean. Yeah, that's so weird. It doesn't make any sense. It's it's more suited for the ending to A Star is Born than it is to Valley of the Dolls. Exactly. I was going to say the exact same thing. It's so strange. And it's like this book is a commentary on the entertainment industry. And then you hand it over for an adaptation in the entertainment industry. And they cut out all of the skating parts. And then Mm -hmm. they're trying to gloss over stuff and make it like this happy-go-lucky kind of critique instead of the skating one. And then Right, you took some things from like A Star is Born and I don't know, it's very strange. And they they also cut out like Jennifer still dies in the movie. But Jennifer's death in the movie is so random. Yeah. It's like she she literally just came back from France and then the next scene she's dead. Yeah. And they're like what? What happened to this entire half of a book? It's just gone. It's just like thrown away. The really strange part for me is when Neely is recounting her time in recovery (laughs) to Anne and Lion. And it's this weird dreamy sequence where they even have like the, the lace and the Vaseline like over the, um, the camera. Season one drag race camera. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so strange and it's all like exposition and very dreamlike. It's such a weird choice. It yeah, it almost by using that lens, which is something that we, you know, usually in film you're using a soft focus lens when it's like like you said, like a dream sequence, like a a happy thing. Like like the I think they even use it in 9 to 5 when when she's Snow White yes. and she accidentally puts poison in the coffee cup. But yeah. it's it's done it like that's a when you use soft focus, you're it's supposed to be a happy feeling. So when you are using soft focus on Neely's time in an institution where she's supposed to be getting clean, it makes you think that she's enjoying this. Mm-hmm. I don't want Neely to enjoy her time in an institution. <laughs> I want her to get clean and leave Lion Burke alone. Yeah. Which doesn't happen. I don't ever get what I want in these books <laughs> <laughs> or in these movies. Oh, I always get the short end of the stick. I mean, it's it, – It is actually – now that I'm like sitting here thinking about it, like the issue that we had with Ready Player One where – you've got this book and then you hand it over to a person that the book is talking about. And then things like the person who did the clothing for this movie is Travilla, who is one of the inspirations for Neely's second husband. Yeah. It's like, they can't, it's sort of like when people make a biopic of someone who is still alive. Yeah. You are not going to get an honest Elton John biopic with Elton John still being alive. And you're not going to get an honest biopic about Queen when there's still people alive and when it's not like a hard R. So you're handing over this book to people that don't want to necessarily be honest about what it's talking about. Yeah. It's it's the Mommy Dear situation all over again. Right. You know, when that book came out, no one no celebrity wanted to own up that they also did the same things to their kids. So they all like rallied around Joan. This is sort of the same situation where it's like they the book came out, everyone called it trash. L- like less than a year later the movie comes out and Hollywood's like we have to remove all the negative. Yeah. Like, that's the whole book. So then what are you giving me? <laughs> you you gave me nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's it feels so hollow. It is very hollow and shallow. Yeah, the girls have no likability whatsoever. No, no. Whereas in the in the book, you're kind of like proud of them for wanting to have this independent streak and wanting to own their lives. In the movie, you're like, what are you getting from? Th- why are you just... <sighs> The the only reason why you like them in the movie is accidental. It's yeah. because of who they are as their own actual people. Sharon Tate is 
actually like kind of talented and she's very pretty, but you don't give a shit about Jennifer. Patty Duke is extremely likable, but her character Neely is not. And she's a dick. Yeah. <laughs> Barbara Parkins, you don't care about. Susan Hayward is interesting that she's in this movie, but at the back of your mind, you're like, but Judy would have been, this Judy would have been, been such a good bookend between A Star is Born and then Valley of the Dolls. It would have been great. So you're just watching Susan Hayward thinking like, well, it's not Judy though. And then she's standing in the middle of that like weird wind chime thing, singing her song. Don't even, like, I love that stupid <laughs> thing. <laughs> um... So weird. <laughs> well, that's that's something that Jesse Jesse watched that part with me too, and he was like, "I don't understand what's happening." And I had to explain to him, uh, for th- you know, once again, everybody, the book was in the '40s, and in the '40s, yeah, we had Broadway musicals, but we also had a lot of like famous famous people coming and just doing like almost like a vaudeville like Follies situation. So you'd have dance numbers, musical numbers with up and comers. You'd have the star come out and do all these beautiful numbers and kind of weave a story together. It does not translate to this movie when the movie is set directly smack dab in the 60s because they could have been performing Oklahoma (laughs) or Annie Get Your Gun or the, you know, you could have done Sound of Music. You could have done anything. Instead, you just put that weird 60s like glass chandelier thing on that stage and just let it spin slowly around our our wannabe <laughs> Ethel Merman. Um it was like making me anxious. I'm like, it's, she's gonna run right into it. I told you she started I wanted actually one. <laughs> when she actually like took a step forward, I'm like, oh girl, oh you gotta watch out. One of these stained glass things is going to knock you off the stage. I'm going to make you one. A small one. Not a big one. I can't afford a big one. I'm going to make you a small one. Be like, enjoy. Oh, so but weird. Speaking of Judy Garland in that role, how good would that bathroom scene have been if it had been Judy Garland instead? Oh, are you kidding me? So good. I would have died ten times over. I would have <laughs> literally, you know, deceased. <laughs> There's and what I love about that is it's a direct page to screen. Right. Um, there is a scene in the book and in the movie where Neely Neely makes her triumphant return to New York City, and <laughs> she has a run in with with Helen Lawson in the in the powder room, and she does it on purpose. You know, um, she basically attacks Helen because Helen in the book Helen says. Um, Something about her kids. Spoiler alert, Neely is a mom um, in the book. They're all moms in the book, not in the movie, because what what is it we always say? Hollywood hates children. <laughs> um, really, they do. The more they I do. think about it, the more it's true. They don't it like having true. kids. Um, Neely fights Helen Lawson in the bathroom and takes off Helen Lawson's wig, and it is a wig reveal for the ages because no one knew (laughs) Helen Lawson was wearing a wig and her can I just say her hair underneath gorge it's better it's It's better so much better it's all white Uh, and gorgeous Hayward did not have gray hair so she actually bleached and then dyed her hair for the movie and I think she looks better I loved it I was like girl you don't need that wig but Neely she's got like uh Glenn Close Helen Mirren and Devil Wears Prada, that, like, really pretty... It's not, like, gray. It's, like, white. It's, like, yeah. a, a really light color. Like, and a it's glossy. so full. And, yeah, and it's, like, voluminous. It's it's, oh, it's so beautiful. I want that hair. That's the kind of hair I, I do want. too. Just a little bit longer, <laughs> like, shoulder length, at least. But Exactly. Everyone has such thick hair in this movie. <laughs> it's annoying. Oh, my hair is so thin. Why? But, um... Neely flushes her wig down the toilet, or tries to, and then throws it over the bathroom stall and it lands and it just goes splat. (laughs) (laughs) Cracks me up. Neely is awful. Neely is horrendous. Neely is a dick. But that scene is so beautiful. (laughs) I'm sorry, but in the book, that scene is in the book, yet um, Jacqueline Susanna originally did not have it. And her editor told her to add something in along those lines for more of a conflict between them and that's where I'm like 
where you get some of the bitchiness and cattiness and where it almost feels like it's written by a man, it's because of the misogynistic ideas that she allowed to seep in, whether yeah. subconsciously or not, or on purpose. Like, the idea that there has to be some sort of bitchy cat fight between two women um particularly older and younger is, is such a sexist thing and when you know you talk about like how in the movie there's no clear indication that they're best friends i was kind of like laughing in my head when you said that because we talked about little women and how the book little women is a big book for women and how it seeps into the rest of pop culture and even when we did waiting to exhale it a big difference between Little Women waiting to exhale in this movie is that in the other two movies, it's clear that they care for each other and that yeah. they are best friends and they love each other. Even if it's just like that one scene where all of the women in waiting to exhale are drinking and laughing <laughs> and there's none of that in this. There is no love amongst women in this. They're all just competitive or just existing together. Yeah. And that's, that's the other big change from the book to the film is that at least in the book you have Anne and Jennifer have this really good friendship in the book and they always they write to each other and they come they separate and they come back you know even at the beginning the three of them live together in that apartment you know and they really yeah even when they all thought they were going to get off and get married they were still thinking about how can I you know, still support my friends who are still living in this place. Like, it felt like a really good friendship bond at the beginning. But because we don't know how they really know each other in the film, you never have that. So it's really just this dissonance between every female character. Because even in the book, right. Anne is friends with Helen Lawson. Right. Yeah. I And I like that part. Me too. Um, where... And yeah, because to jump back to the book for just a second, do you think because she's told that she doesn't really know Helen, but she's convinced that they did have a friendship between the two of them? And I, I agree. I think that they were on like yeah. a different level than just that superficial hanger on kind of oh, thing. Yeah. I 100% agree. I think that, you know, after you read the whole book and you look at it as a whole, I think Helen Lawson is definitely was at one point a Neely. But she had right. to get through to the other side. She had to stop being a dick and realize how to <laughs> be an adult. And once she became an adult, she realized that because she was a dick like Neely, she has no friends. Right. And she puts a lot of that into this – she puts a whole lot, too much, into a relationship with Anne. That Anne, at that time, because of her upbringing, doesn't know how to really hold on to those emotions that Helen is releasing now. Because mm -hmm. Helen's constantly talking about her ex-husband who – you know, her her first love who died and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I definitely think that there's a, a strong bond there, and I wish that had been in the film. Right. I wish there had been one friendship <laughs> in the film. Just one female Just friendship. Just give us one. <laughs> a friendship that was not between Neely and Pills. Just one <sighs> friendship. Because <sighs> that's... that's like, it, it's just very... To go from a book that kind of has these very heavy, semi-heavy feminist overtones to a film where it's just like, here's some very pretty women. They're going to take some pills. They're going to sleep with these guys. And then we'll see what happens. <laughs> it's it's a big letdown. And like with as, as much of a struggle that I had with the book with some of the writing, the writing in the movie is just a <laughs> joke. It is a laugh. And, like, and Neely, I feel like, has all the best ones. Like, when she's walking down the street and she's like, boobies, boobies, boobies. <laughs> <laughs> and then when she's, I think, I think, I want to say it's when she's at the bar and she, like, puts on her own song and mm -hmm. she's singing it and the guy makes fun of her and she's like, I'm traveling incognito. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, she's like, I'm not high, and she puts her sunglasses on. <laughs> like, girl, go home. And then there's one. Uh, it's at the very beginning when uh, Sharon Tate's still in that like ridiculous headdress, and then she like, it's such, it's so weird. It almost looks like it's like a, the room level weird edit where it just cuts from Neely to Sharon Tate like opening the door, and she sticks her head in, and she says something like. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, honey. That bitch should be boiled in oil. Like, <laughs> yeah. 
It's like they felt like they'd had to give her one extra line. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. But at the beginning, I also like the... I feel so bad for Sharon Tate because she gets like the butt end of a lot of these lines. Because at the beginning, (laughs) she's standing there with that huge headdress on and her boobs are propped really high up. And she goes, I feel a little top heavy. And everyone (laughs) laughs. Oh, God. Oh, she deserved better. She deserved she really better. R.I.P. Sharon Tate, you deserve better. And then, like, there's weird stuff that's, like, just background things where, like, it's Patty Duke, and she drinks, like, this big thing of milk. And oh. I'm just, like, staring at this big glass of milk, and I'm like, Bleh. Oh, yeah. Well, she she takes the milk from the, the hallway, just opens it up and drinks it, and I'm like, how long has that been sitting out there? Is that warm milk? That is so gross. Exactly. It's that chocolate then- or strawberry. It's straight milk. <laughs> And then at the, uh, it's the pool scene when they're fighting. It's like her and Ugh. her husband and then the girls like running out. And it is so horribly ADR'd where they had to like come in later and like, you know, record their voices separately. Yeah. It's like a joke. It's just so awkward. I, I don't know how you can make a, the guy who directed this movie was one of the editors Citizen Kane. How do you go from editing Citizen Kane to you don't even know how to layer on ADR in a pool? Yeah. It's like you lost lost it all. I don't know. <laughs> but that that pool scene, she looks gorgeous. Oh, I love it. And her in that like white, you know, blouse and the little skirt. Oh, yeah. She looks great. Everything everything they wear. I mean, I guess this is leading up to the most important fashion hair <laughs> beauty moment of the entire film the gillian girl yeah i'm gonna be one i don't care what i have to do i know it's fake i just i want to stand on the top of a mountain (laughs) just like Anne. (laughs) the visually speaking the gillian girl scene and then when it's the moment where Neely is transitioning into from, you know, chorus girl to big star and they're doing like all of those really crazy retro cutscenes yeah. and like the quick cuts. I don't know how like how do you even explain that? It's it's just a weird montage. Yeah. Of it's it's very bizarre. It reminds me of um um what is it? Like Bye Bye Birdie, there's a scene in Bye Bye Birdie yeah. where there's where they talk about Conrad Birdie and they keep doing these quick cuts to just a still photo of him. And mm-hmm. they keep moving the photo so it looks like he's gyrating his hips and stuff. That's basically all they're yeah. doing in Neely's exercise scene. Yeah. <laughs> but it works. It, I love works. it, it works. It's <laughs> yeah. perfect. Yeah. Neely's exercise scene, uh, especially when she tries to do that cartwheel. <laughs> <laughs> and then she ends up doing like a weird tap dance number which is definitely the costume everything where she's dressed uh, as the the old the like the bum looking man uh-huh 100 this is like if you guys were questioning if she was judy garland or not she is dressed 100 percent just like judy garland is in easter parade uh yes. when they do a couple of swells same exact situation and i was like ugh guys are trying too hard it's my favorite number at easter parade don't even i know what you're doing here um but it's but like almost a scene, debbie reynolds thing too because it looks like singing in the rain yes and in that scene when um it's like all the different like it, within that montage there's like a part where she actually like looks down the lens into the camera and like winks and kind of mm-hmm. makes a silly face and that's where like that's the neely that you like is the young fun Neely and that's where Patty Duke is like very successful but she's only successful because she's Patty Duke not because of the writing or anything yeah and that's really the only glimpse of her that we have as being yes. young because previous to that she really doesn't add much to the film no it's during that montage scene that you're like ah, oh, this is this girl's cute and fun and then afterwards she's awful yeah <laughs> because it immediately goes to that pool scene right um the Gillian girl thing in the book the book does everything. This is where I'm going to I'm going to say it now. The book is better than the movie. Um yeah. even though the book has awful writing, so does the movie. It um <laughs> the Gillian girl scene in the book 
is such a slow rise. You know, she meets a guy at a party. Then he's like, uh, he's asking her all these weird questions like, are those your real teeth? Is that your real hair? You know, and that's when he decides he wants her to be the model, blah, blah, blah. In the movie, she just walks into Henry Bellamy's office and the guy's like, I want a girl like her. You're like, what? And he's like, yeah, I want her to be my Gillian girl. And then all of a sudden, she's the Gillian girl. And that all goes back to the idea that they didn't struggle for anything. There wasn't any right. questioning about if what they were doing was right or wrong. All of a sudden, she was just this star. But it is so 60s. Very. Very twiggy perfection. I'm sorry. I, I could hate this film, you know... I could say awful, awful things, but I will never say anything wrong about the Gillian girl scene. <laughs> I can't, I can't do it. The hair, my God, there's one hairdo that she has where it's like this big, long, long, like down to her butt ponytail, but it's got this like donut wrap situation in the center. So it almost looks like she's wearing a big pointy princess hat <laughs> as hair. And I was, I, I was like, man, that should have been my wedding hair. I did this all wrong. <laughs> You like change for the uh, your wedding reception, and you've got that like ridiculous wig, that like super tight, close one. <laughs> yes. Hi, it's me, your Gillian girl. Um, the colors in that scene. She's wearing that long blue chiffon gown and just standing in the wind while she yeah. sprays her hair with hair spray. Man, they knew how to use wind in like the sixties too. Oh yeah. <laughs> She, that scene is gorgeously shot. It yeah. is, which which is another thing where you're looking at that and you're like, did the same guy shoot this whole film? <laughs> How did you screw this up so much but make this one part so good? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just the film and the book do not, they're not cohesive. Yeah. No, they're very inconsistent. It's, uh. It's so, it's so bizarre, but I, there was an interesting, uh, there was a documentary that came out in 2006 called, uh, gotta get off this merry-go-round sex dolls and show tunes, mm -hmm. uh, which Barbara Perkins was in and she, she actually was very upset with the way the director shot how they, uh, the whole pill addiction part of it. Ah. And she, she goes on to say uh, that if we had had Martin Scorsese come in and direct this film, you know, <laughs> he would have sat us down. He would have put you through the whole emotional, physical, mental feeling of what that drug was doing to you. That would have been a whole different film. I mean, that's kind of a silly thing to say, though. I mean, like if Martin Scorsese yeah. came in and did Mac and Me, that would be a different movie, too. <laughs> I would definitely watch it, though. A real <laughs> gritty version of Mac and Me. I wonder how we'd do that whole wheelchair scene. No, no, where it has to stay. <laughs> just, just all of a sudden he intercuts the original scene. <laughs> the, that, that scene is precious. We cannot. That is gold. You don't change that, that part. Is that your Gillian girl scene? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I, I uh. get what she is saying, though. It. And it's yeah, what it's yeah. what my problem is too. Like in the like I said with the book, you have these these layers to the drugs and what it does to these girls. And then in the movie, you just have Anne taking a handful of pills and crawling into the ocean. Like mm -hmm. there's no understanding or connection between what we're seeing on screen and what we should be feeling about it. The, what's really strange about this movie is that it's 1967. So this is the new Hollywood era, but it's at the very beginning of new Hollywood. So it's very strange because you've got references to pills and homosexuality and you have even like breasts that yeah. I was surprised. I forgot that there was as much nudity in this movie as there is. And yet it's still trying so hard to be a technicolor film it's still trying to be the classic hollywood of seeing the rain or something yeah and had you maybe waited to do the movie until say 1971 i with a different director it could have been good it could have actually surpassed the book and done something really cool but unfortunately that is not the movie that we have yeah i think i i agree i think they rushed it 
definitely rushed it. Um, the one thing I, I do kind of like about the movie, not just the Gillian girl scene versus a book, is the way they ended the movie. Mm-hmm. Anne isn't, Anne's alone at the end of it. She doesn't have a mm-hmm. kid. It's almost as if at the, I think the ending to the movie should have been the ending to the book. I think you mix it because the ending of the movie is a little too happy and ambiguous for me. But see, I maybe I just read into it a different way. I feel like she's she's finally understanding that she didn't need to be. She doesn't need Lion to be the woman that she wanted to be. But that's the thing is that in in the book she she will never understand that. Oh yeah. We want we want something good to happen. Yeah. One of these women. I just want one of the women to have something good happen. Um, it it ugh. is stronger when it comes to women for her to have the ending that she does in the yeah. movie, but not everything ends well. Yeah. No, everything's still crap. Like there, make yeah. no mistake, the movie is not happy. Um, the book not happy. But I just wanted one of them, <laughs> just one moment, to really like. Something that I could actually applaud, you know, because mm-hmm. you can't do it in either the book or the movie. In the book, you're so upset with some of the choices that they're making. And in the movie, those choices are all gone. They just do it. And you're like, I can't. <laughs> the The problem with Anne is that like her addiction isn't as clear as Neely's is with pills. Her addiction is lion. Oh, yeah. Lion is her addiction. And then the pills are just an a, a symptom, yeah. a side effect of her addiction to lion. And that's how she ends it in the book. Whereas the movie kind of gives her a release from her addiction to lion. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good way of putting it. She is definitely addicted to him. Uh, I don't know why I saw him in the movie. He's not, all, he's not that good. No, he's not that good. I think the way I, I see him in my head when reading the book mm-hmm. is better than he was in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, you guys. Do better. <laughs> Do better. Did not like him. Actually, I didn't like any of the guys. None no. of the guys in the movie were attractive. And it's weird because there were really attractive actors at that time. You could have picked anybody. Yeah. They um, all kind of look the same, too. Yeah. Ooh, all- did you notice a special first time appearance by a, a special actor right before Neely's big freak out? Uh, no, no. Okay, you know when she's at the theater and she's <laughs> she's in her wrong costume or whatever, and the guy yes. knocks on her door and is like, yeah. Miss O'Hara, yeah. it's Richard Dreyfus. What? Yes! I missed that completely. Oh my God, go back and rewatch it. Um, I, I recognized him right away, and then I did a Google search, and I was like, that could not have been him. You, yeah. you know, and I, I was like... Tap, 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 tap. He actually did an interview where he thought this movie was going to end his career before it started because he didn't, he filmed that scene and apparently he didn't know how much, uh, like where it was at in the movie, how big of a, of a, of a part it really was. So I imagine he was probably, he probably filmed a lot more of it, but he, uh, was reading the reviews of how trashed it was. So he didn't actually see it right away and he was really concerned about his career. And then he ended up going to see it one day. Uh, and realized that he was only in the last few seconds of the film. So he was like, oh, it's okay. You know, I, I just pulled it up. I, that's him. That's crazy. Yeah. I completely missed it. Oh Isn't it nuts? Like, he says two lines, not even. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just got, like, chills looking at that picture. That's crazy. Such a baby. He is a baby. He's a little baby. I love it. I love it so much. Aww. It's so good. <laughs> It's one of those little Easter egg things where you're like, what? Yeah. Ugh. But then, you know, Neely has her freak out and that trumps everything. See, the photos of the three of them on like the little lounge in the bed, that's as close as yeah. they ever get. <laughs> yes. When you look at the posters or you look at the pictures, you assume that there's that they're best friends. Yeah. Like if you were just to take a look at that photo with the three of them and they're all wearing like white or off-white yeah. and their hair gorge and you're like there must be a scene where the three of them are together in a room and they're confronting somebody 
Yeah. No. No. They uh, no. It's like honestly, I don't. There, I think there's only like one scene where they're all in the scene together, and even then, they're not in the same shot together. You know, it's like I, I've said this so many times in other episodes that oh, this should be a TV show. You could actually do Valley of the Dolls as a movie. It it could absolutely be like an yeah. HBO TV show, one hundred percent. But you could do Valley of the Dolls as a movie. And I know I just recently referenced Little Women, but the genius behind what um she did as a director and how she presented all the stories as kind of like flashbacks going around. That's how you could do this is oh, yeah. maybe it's Anne's point of view, like her perspective, and then kind of hopping around with them being friends and all the struggles and everything. I mean, you could still do this as a movie, but this is not a successful adaptation. Yeah. Like, no, I agree. Like Greta Gerwig could take it. Honestly, you said the whole thing with the flashbacks. I was like, start it. I'm going to write it for you guys. <laughs> We're going to start it at the end when she's laying in bed and yes. she hears she hears Lion come in with right. that other woman. And then she gets up to go to the bathroom and starts looking at her face, and she's got red eyes. And then she mm-hmm. says something like, it wasn't always like this. Flashback. <laughs> Come on, you guys. Someone do it. Because I agree. There are ways to make this film work. And I get it. The length is is daunting. But there's a lot that can be condensed, a lot that could be cut. Like If they can do it with Gone with the Wind, right. you can do it with anything. Yeah. Okay, maybe not anything. I mean, there are some. We literally just discussed how Mommy Dear should be a TV show and not a movie. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, if you're going to yeah. – if you want to do a faithful adaptation of this book to film, it can be done. You just have to have the right person writing the script and the right person directing it. Because mm-hmm. there's so many nuanced bits in this book that should have been in this film that were not. Do you have Greta Gerwig's number? Can we just text her real quick? Because now I'm like obsessed with her doing another adaptation. Uh, most deaf. I'm just going to call her right now. Hold on. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. hold on. Beep, boop, 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 beep, boop, boop. <laughs> hold on. I got her voicemail. Greta. Oh, dang. Greta. It's, it's Nicole and Christina. Christina, say hi to Greta. Hi, Greta. Hi. We need you to do an adaptation of Valley of the Dolls. Please. Yeah. And like relatively soon. It's still pretty relevant, kind of. Okay. Oh, it's very relevant, yeah. Yeah, right? Um, yeah. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Um, love you. Mean it. Bye. Bye. <laughs> She's deaf going to get in touch with us. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. if only. boom that would be if that actually happened (laughs) all of a sudden we find out that she's doing it i'm gonna tell everyone it was our idea (laughs) listen this is our affirmation for today this is we put it out into the universe yeah it's all positive energy it's out there let's make it happen yeah come on witches let's get together and Mm -hmm. manifest this because we've earned it (laughs) (laughs) Oh. oh i don't Honestly, because this is not a true adaptation, you know, I don't know where else to go with this, you know? Well, uh, uh, Jacqueline Suzanne said that the film was a piece of shit. <laughs> she gets it. You know, I, it. I, I like her. She threw a drink in Johnny Carson's face once. I like her. <laughs> No, she, yeah, she seems like she was pretty awesome. She definitely uh, seems like the type of person you and I would hang out with. She had moxie. Yeah, she definitely had moxie. Like, for some of the stuff that she went through, I'm, Oof. even if she writes about a guy calling boobies babies, listen, I'll still <laughs> hang out with her. She had drive. Like, the, I don't yeah. know. I, I didn't know anything about her until I started doing a little bit of research for this. And I just found myself enjoying reading her, you know, her biographies. Yeah. Well, she she made this happen for herself. That's yeah. That's something that I found to be so endearing about her was that she she got her, you know, cancer diagnosis before she wrote this book. And then while she after she got that, she was, she basically said, you know, you know, hey, God, 
I I just want to be a famous writer. If you just give me some time to do that. She manifested that. She did. And she did it. She did the work. And I think that's such a honestly I would watch a movie about her making this book. Yes. And I would I want to I that's what we should get is a biopic about her. I think this would be a great I think it's something that we could all look up to. A woman who who makes it on her like I don't want to say she makes it on her own. She was married at the time, but she knew what she wanted and she went after it. Even mm-hmm. if everyone said that she was trash for doing it, Truman Capote. But she went out <laughs> and she did it, Johnny Carson. She did the thing. <laughs> I'm calling them all out. I'm you dragging are dragging you, you are calling all. out taking names. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm getting revenge for her, and you're all they're all dead now, so I guess I have to go fight some ghosts or something, but <laughs> I do. I think she's one of those authors that definitely she didn't care. Yeah. But when you think about what we can take away from Valley of the Dolls, the book and the movie, is that she gave us permission to have, you know, the Sex in the City, both the mm-hmm. book and the TV series and all the movies. She made it okay for what women were dealing with privately to be known publicly. Yeah. Like, uh, what are the, like, is it Jackie Collins who writes all those other weird yeah. <laughs> feminist books? You know, I don't want to call them feminist books, but they're all in the same vein as like Valley of the Dolls. This Valley of the Dolls walked so everything else we're reading now can run. You know, I will say though that, that like everything you just mentioned is definitely from like a privileged white woman perspective. I know. It definitely <laughs> is. Yes, indeed. It, and but it's like at least it's it's a start for yeah. women and then you know we gotta just like oh yeah we out. have a long way to go like yeah. trust me yeah. sex in the city is not not an inclusive oh no anything uh it is super problematic it is terrible <laughs> valley of the dolls was pretty problematic but it, at least it never went it's just i don't want to say it never went yeah. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just the whole thing. We're still struggling to really include diversity in a lot of these conversations about women because we're still struggling to have conversations about women. No, it, it's like with book, it, it's funny because it is very problematic with a lot of stuff. Like the one that was cringeworthy was every time Neely said the F word when it yeah. comes to gay guys. And like I'm like just like oh okay here we go and but with Jennifer I thought it was really interesting that she's kind of the only one out of the three that gets satisfaction from sex and part of it is because of her lesbian tryst because it took a woman to teach her like how to satisfy herself sexually so then like from there on she mentions how she basically has to teach men how to pleasure a woman and I just thought that was really interesting because even like today you have guys that you you have a society that doesn't want women to be sexual that is still a problem and well no they want us they want women to be sexual but for them not for right yes right thank you so (laughs) you're welcome (laughs) (laughs) you're welcome for me pointing out misogyny (laughs) no but it's still like a taboo to have like a i mean you've got wet ass pussy like you've got like a song where it's shocking that a woman is talking about like enjoying sex like that's still a problem yeah it's anytime a woman is enjoying her sexuality her body anytime a woman puts herself first it becomes an issue for everybody i mean Mm -hmm. even looking at uh the recent photo shoot for Billie eilish the news that's coming out <laughs> isn't from a woman's perspective. The news that's coming out is yes, own your body, feel good in your skin, do your thing. The news that's coming out from other from the other side is like, oh, so now it's okay for you to show your body when you before you were like all in those baggy clothes and stuff before she was a child. Yeah, before she was a child, and it's that whole idea that unless a man gives you permission to look good 
it's still going to be questioned in mainstream media as to why you feel mm-hmm. the need to look good. Yeah. <sighs> This is so fun. I'm so glad we had this conversation. This is so fun. Oh my God, I'm having so much fun. You know, this is the type of conversation that would make me want to take a doll as soon as we're done. <laughs> Where are my uppers? Because this is a downer. <laughs> uh, no, I am not on any medication. Probably should be, but I'm not. Um, no, this was, there's so much to unpack here. With Valley of the Dolls. And there's so much that you could read into it. I know that in my research, it is, you know, it is divided as to whether this is or is not a feminist book. It is controversial for the subject matter. Um, It's controversial for the way the film was portrayed. Controversial for why Judy Garland got fired from the film. Yeah. So there's so much you can dig into it. But I, is there anything else you want to say about either? The, I only had one extra thing that I wanted to say, which was um, I found it interesting that Harlan Ellison was one of the screenwriters and he did not like the changes that they later on made to have it a little bit more happy, particularly as the ending. So he had his name completely like stripped from <laughs> the the movie. Um, I don't know. I, I was just like not expecting Harlan Ellison of all people to be yeah. associated with Valley of the Dolls. It's not exactly... What I think of as his... <laughs> it's not something in his wheelhouse, really. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was interesting. But he made a smart move, I think. Yeah. Removing yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, I think, I think you were smart. <laughs> Honestly, the only person who really did well with this film was John Williams. I, st- I don't like the score. I know, but apparently like the it. Oscar committee really did. And look at him now. <laughs> 800 Oscars <laughs> later, he he Look was a phoenix. He's, he's doing great. He's a phoenix <laughs> that rose from the ashes. Like, think about it. <sighs> yeah. I, I, like, of course, everybody knows who John Williams is, but somehow the fact that he did Valley of the Dolls, I, I missed. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, same. It's going to be something that lives. I've, I don't know how anyone can. I would have never associated him with this. Well, I the funny thing about John Williams, everybody thinks of the big ones, you know, Jaws, Star Wars, Jurassic Park, Harry Potter. One of my favorite scores that he ever did was actually for Memoirs of a Geisha. I think that when he so gets funny. out of the big orchestra scores and he just kind of explores other music is when he is kind of like the strongest. Like, obviously, yeah. he does themes like nobody else, but he has more to him himself than yeah. just the big orchestras. I would love to see him. Uh, this period. <laughs> just see him. Just see him in person. <laughs> just shake his hand just once. No, I um, – my family used to go see the Boston Pops yeah. uh, at Christmas time. And occasionally he does go back and still perform at the Pops. Uh, that's always been one of my goals is to see him perform at the Pops. I want to see him do Handel's Messiah. Just, I mean, it's like Handel's Messiah is like eight hours long. But I would <laughs> – if John Williams is doing it, I'd sit through it. Just take an upper beforehand. <laughs> Me in a stormtrooper costume. It's like, <laughs> oh, handles Messiah. I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, uh, I mean, now it's time to uh, yeah to put it to the test. Where Here shall go. it go? Um, we need to like just needs to come up with that theme song when we come to the book list. <laughs> Like, da, 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 da. something john williams would have done for this movie it should definitely be like a game show theme um so once again we're at that fun part in the podcast the 2021 book rating um uh, for those who missed it last week we put mommy dearest above ready player one but below the birds so we're at wizard of oz high fidelity waiting to exhale a night to remember who framed roger rabbit the birds mommy dearest Ready Player One and Eat, Pray, Love. Ugh, I said it. <laughs> um, it's not a, a good adaptation. The no. Film. And the book is so long. Yeah. <laughs> and drags on. Honestly, I might put this below Mommy Dearest. 
Uh, that's the one I'm struggling with right now. I feel like it's definitely either above or below Mommy Dearest. Yeah. No question. Yeah. The only reason why I would I I would prefer Mommy Dearest. I would reread Mommy Dearest and rewatch Mommy Dearest mm-hmm. before I do either of those things with Valley of the Dolls. For, that's, for sure. That's my thinking. I mean, like I said, I've only ever read before this reading, I've only read this book twice before. And mm-hmm. every time I feel like I feel like I pick it up and I go, I don't remember it being this long. <laughs> I think that's why I would put it below Mommy Dearest. The the only reason why I would put it above Mommy Dearest is that it does have some feminist points and it does show a deep, dark side of the entertainment industry with these three women. Yeah. And the storytelling can be strong. When it's good, it's good, even though it's a melodrama and a soap opera. It, when it's good, it's pretty good. And the writing with Mommy Dearest is not yeah. good. You know, you are you are correct. Even the film Mommy Dearest looks more like a Lifetime Channel original movie version. Right. Whereas at least Valley of the Dolls is polished and looks like a a film. So you know, I would agree with you then. Oop. I'm I'm doing it. I'm laying it all down. <laughs> so Mommy Dearest gets pushed down a peg <gasps> and we're making room for some dolls. Yeah. So Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, <laughs> it's Wizard of Oz, High Fidelity, Waiting to Exhale, A Night to Remember, Roger Rabbit, The Birds, Valley of the Dolls, Mommy Dearest, Ready Player One, and Eat, Pray, Love. Um, honestly, I would love it if people wanted to reach out and tell us where they think these books should actually go. Oh, that would be fun. That could be another like Instagram thing we find yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, head over to our Instagram page at some point and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> we want we want to hear from you the people the people <laughs> we want to give the people what they want um <laughs> well and what are we what are we going to do next time oh oh man remember how um <laughs> remember how mother's day we had one mother of a podcast <laughs> yeah. well the devil's in the details <laughs> I lo- <laughs> God, I hate myself. I love it. Uh, sometimes I say things and I go, I shouldn't have done that. But I do it anyways. Um, anyways, what <laughs> all of that is to say is that as we move into a month of fathers, there's no daddy like the devil. <laughs> we are bringing to you the classic Rosemary's Baby. I I did not realize, by the way, that the way that we planned this out was going <laughs> Mommy yeah. Dearest, Valley of the Dolls, Rosemary's Baby. I mean, this is a tight, yeah, you know, timeline that we've got here. It is. But, and to go from Valley of the Dolls to Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. We've got we've got one mindset and it's all 60s all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I'm I am ready. I am ready. I Love the film. Um, yes. And I'll admit it, I have not read the book. I um, I love the book a lot. Love the movie. And I also, I, I didn't realize that we were going from Sharon Tate in Valley of the Dolls to Roman Polanski, Rosemary's Baby. Oh. Holy oh. shit. <laughs> Holy shit, guys. Oh, oh God, you guys. We're going to, we're going to be stuck in this feeling for a while. Oh, it's so I'm like I've got my hand on my face. It's so fucking problematic. What did we do? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. How did we not think of that before we recorded this? I don't know. It just struck me. <laughs> oh God. Um. So let us apologize in advance for some strong feelings on the next episode. And let me get this out of the way now. Scary Harry Paw. Um. I'm going to say it a couple more times on the next episode. Sure. Um, <laughs> but I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, that's our, uh, our one of our big Father's Day offerings to you guys. The devil. The devil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, I am so excited, and I wish we could do it now. But Me too. Me too. Unfortunately, it's time to sparkle. By that, yeah. I t- sparkle, Neely, sparkle. And by that, I do mean 
uh, it's time for us to hit the road. So thank you again, Christina, for doing thank this. Thank you. This has been fun. Yeah. Thank you for not being Neely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad that we have a, a better friendship than these ladies do. Well, we actually talk and stuff. I know. <laughs> We actually know each other. It's it's yeah. different. Um, and thanks again to Jesse for making us sound smart. Most smart. Yes, smartest. thank you, Jesse. <laughs> and yeah, uh, we can't wait to talk about Rosemary's baby with you guys in the next episode. Yay! Whoop whoop! All right. Bye, Christina. Bye, Nikki. Bye.